Welcome to the virtual field trip for the Great Salt Lake and Lake Bonneville. Lake Bonneville was a large freshwater lake that was present in Utah during the Ice Age. There were also some bays and inlets that extended into Nevada and Idaho. Together, it covered about 20,000 square miles at its largest extent and was about 1,000 feet deep. Lake Bonneville partially drained around 15 to 16,000 years ago when it found an outlet at Red Rock Pass in Idaho. This catastrophic flood dropped the level of the lake about 300 feet. After this, the climate started to warm about 12,000 years ago, and most of the rest of the lake just dried up. Two factors caused Lake Bonneville to form basin and range extension and the ice age in basin and range extension normal faults caused valley blocks or grobbins to drop down relative to the surrounding mountains many of these grobbins did not have an outlet to the sea and still do not to this day this created many of the basins that contained Lake Bonneville along with several other ancient lakes in what is now the Great Basin. The Great Basin is not a single basin, but a complex of adjacent basins that do not have an outlet to the sea. We are looking at an elevation profile across the basin and range, extending from roughly the Orem area to the uh, northern part of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Now, all the valleys are grobbins and the mountain blocks are horse. At least this is the very simplified version of it. So we can see the horse labeled there, and then the grobbins are the valleys. To give you some perspective, the wider Grobbin here is the Bonneville Salt Flats that you can see there on the map view. And then this here is Utah Valley here. Lake Bonneville extended to roughly 5,100 feet above sea level and so would have filled all these valleys like so, while Lake Lahontan was not as high and not as large or deep. This map shows Lake Bonneville, Lake Lahontan, and several other Ice Age lakes that were present here in the Great Basin. The cross-section that we looked at previously was roughly along this red line. Stop one is at Salt Air. To get to Salt Air, you can take exit 104 off of Interstate 80. You will also find a link to Google Maps with directions in the notes for the slide on the PowerPoint. Now, uh, from this vantage, you can see multiple shorelines for Lake Bonneville. The upper shoreline is the Bonneville shoreline, about 5,200 feet in elevation. And then the lower one is about 300 feet lower and represents the Provo shoreline. You can see these shorelines all over the Wasatch Front. Now, the Great Salt Lake averages about 4,200 feet in elevation, which means that uh, Lake Bonneville at its highest level was about 1,000 feet deeper than the Great Salt Lake. Here we're looking at just a few of those other places where you can see the shorelines along the Wasatch Front. Here we see the Bonneville shoreline near Brigham City. You can see that as this horizontal line roughly there. And here we see the Bonneville shoreline at the mouth of Rock Canyon. You may remember this from the virtual field trip for Rock Canyon that you should have watched previously. Now it is important to note that the shoreline at this point is 5,100 feet, give or take, which is actually lower than what we see at Salt Air. 
So why aren't all these shorelines, which should be the same elevation, they formed at the same elevation, why aren't they the same elevation now? And so there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that uh, many sections of the Bonneville shoreline crisscross the Wasatch Fault and other faults up and down the mountain front. And so where these faults have moved since the shoreline formed, sections of the shoreline may be displaced relative to each other. Also, some other deformation has happened since the time of Lake Bonneville. The mechanism that explains most of the deformation is isostatic rebound. We see isostatic rebound after glaciers melt, for instance. As the weight of glacial ice is removed, the crust slowly springs back up. The basin of Lake Bonneville is undergoing the same process. Since Lake Bonneville was 1,000 feet deep, it did add a lot of weight to the crust. We have seen isostatic adjustments for many large reservoirs, although in the opposite direction. Now, as Lake Bonneville drained and dried up, the release of the weight caused the ground to decompress, causing uplift. This uplift was more demonstrated in the center where the lake was deeper, and then as the weight was released, the uplift was greater. And so on this map, these concentric lines you see are contour lines showing the amount of uplift, isostatic rebound, that has happened since Lake Bonneville. And it shows how high each of the shorelines are, each of the points for the Bonneville shoreline, the uppermost shoreline is across the basin. So here's what we mean by that difference in elevation for the same shoreline. If you remember down by Rock Canyon, the elevation for the uh, Bonneville shoreline there is about 5,100 feet. So really about 5,140 if we look at their closest point on this map. But uh, the shoreline that we're looking at uh, previously up by Brigham City is about 5,180 feet. So it's actually about 40 feet higher. And if you look up and down the Wasatch Front, you'll see that the elevations for all these different points where we have the same shoreline, it varies by about 50 feet or so, depending on what segment you're looking at. Now, part of that is because this part of the shoreline crisscrosses the Wasatch Fault. And so you have lots of segments of the shoreline have been bisected and uh, distorted by having it cross the fault. However, if we look at the uh, what was more the center of Lake Bonneville, we see that uh, things are a little different. So we see that uh, down over here near Salt Air, that the elevation for the Bonneville shoreline there is about 5,208 feet. And so it's about 60 feet higher than what we saw over at Rock Canyon. And then over near Stansbury Island, which we'll be looking at in a moment, that is about uh, 5,280 feet in elevation. And so basically here at Stansbury, we have the shoreline that is about 140 feet higher than what was at Rock Canyon, even though it's the same shoreline and even though these shorelines formed at the same elevation. But after the shorelines formed and after Lake Bonneville drained and evaporated away, with all that water gone, with over a thousand feet of water gone, that's a lot less weight on the crust and we start to get isostatic rebound. And so because of the isostatic rebound, the shorelines that were around islands in the middle of the lake start to spring up and are now in some cases 100 or 200 feet higher than what they are along the periphery of the lake. This is a cross section showing the amount of uplift across the Bonneville Basin. And so what we see, of course, uh, near 
Rock Canyon, which is along the Wasatch Fault, we do have a little bit of uplift there, but it's not as much as what we see in the center of the lake. Now, down here on the bottom part of this graph, uh, these humps here, these are the depth of the water at various points. And uh, what we see is that uh, in between, these were islands. And so the various mountain ranges were islands at the time. So Stansbury Mountains, those are to the south of Stansbury Island. Uh, but basically, in between the islands, the water was very deep. And so as a consequence of that, they weighed down the crust more. The crust starts to sink under the weight of about a thousand feet of water. But as a thousand feet of water was removed, as Lake Bonneville drained, and then the rest of it evaporated, uh, the crust started to slowly spring back up. And again, we call that isostatic rebound. Moving on to Salt Lake itself, as you go past salt air and descend onto the beach, you might notice some strong smells. And so along the edge of the marshy area, you may have some small pools that uh, will range in salinity from brackish to hypersaline. And these will have some decaying organic material and may have higher sulfate concentrations. And the higher amounts of sulfate from decaying organic material and uh, mineral sulfates will uh, create hydrogen sulfide gas, which is also known as the rotten egg smell. Now this smell will dissipate as you move further down onto the beach. On the beach itself, you may notice a few small pools or depressions that have gypsum crystals. Now gypsum is more soluble than calcite, and so it'll only precipitate out once uh, the waters become more concentrated and the calcite is already dropped out of solution. We see several small gypsum crystals in this footprint. And so the footprint formed the depression in which the hypersaline waters could become saturated enough that it could start to form gypsum crystals. If we take a closer look at the beach sand itself, you may have to dig down below just a thin mineral crust to get at it you will see that it does not look like a regular beach sand. Uh, the grains are very rounded, but they, they don't look like quartz because they're not quartz. Uh, these are what are known as ooids or oolitic sands. And basically they are small chemically precipitated sand grains made of calcite. And so they were precipitated out of the water once the water became saturated in relation to calcite. Here we will perform an acid test to show that the sand is made of calcite and not quartz. Remember that Calcite reacts to acid and quartz does not. Now on the very round shape of these ooids or oolitic sand grains, the Great Salt Lake has reached a salinity that is about 10 times that of the open ocean. It has reached saturation in relation to calcite. Calcite is being precipitated onto tiny particles and the wave action keeps them moving, causing an even coating on all sides. And so it just slowly grows like a pearl. The nuclei, so the starting point for each of these sand grains could be wind-blown dust. It might be silt or clay brought in by the streams and rivers. It may be broken pieces of brine shrimp shells. But most of the ooids start off being precipitated on top of brine, shrimp, fecal pellets. So essentially, the entire beach is nothing but brine, shrimp, poop coated over in calcite. As we get closer to the water, you may start to see some ripple marks. 
Now the ripple marks here will be symmetrical, so they'll be even on both sides. They'll have an even slope. This is something that we see for ripple marks caused by waves. Ripple marks caused by a stream or any directional flow will be asymmetrical, while ripple marks for lakes or oceans or any place that has wave action will be symmetrical. You should also see some flasure bedding. Flasure bedding is when you get a small deposit of lighter weight material in between the ripples. So the ripples form due to wave action, but as the water quiets down, the finer material that was still in suspension starts to settle down and falls down to the troughs in between the ripples. Now these can be lighter uh, clay or silt particles, uh, but oftentimes flasure bedding is very rich in organic material. Despite how things may look from a distance, the Great Salt Lake is actually very alive. As you get along the shore, you will often see what appears to be kind of a brownish foam. This is actually brine shrimp eggs and fragments of brine shrimp exoskeletons. Uh, the lake at various seasons is full of brine shrimp. Now these hatch seasonally, and at the peak each season, there are as many as 14 trillion brine shrimp in the Great Salt Lake. Each year, millions of migratory birds stop at the Great Salt Lake to feed. We get as many as 5 million eared grebes and a half million phallothropes, which is what we see here, uh, stop to feed on the brine shrimp. It is estimated that a single eared grebe will eat as many as 30,000 brine shrimp in a single day. With millions of birds visiting the lake each year, there will be some that do not complete the migration. Feathers and bones can remain on the beaches for years after the bird dies, as they are essentially pickled in the hypersaline waters and sediments. To get to stop two, take exit 84 off of Interstate 80 and turn north towards Stansbury Island. As you go on the road to Stansbury Island, you'll see on either side pools where water from the Great Salt Lake is left to evaporate. Commercial companies allow the water to evaporate to concentrate salt, or halite, from the Great Salt Lake. It should be noted that salt from the Great Salt Lake is technically not food grade because of trace amounts of heavy metals. And instead of being used for food, it is used for rock salt for de-icing roads and other similar purposes. Now the halite is only deposited once less soluble minerals have already precipitated out. So we see that the order of precipitation is first calcite. The calcite forms the ooids that form the beaches. In some of the smaller pools on the beach, you may get gypsum being deposited, which is the second of the main uh, evaporite minerals to be deposited. Halite, or table salt, is the third of the common evaporite minerals to be deposited. It is much more soluble than the other two, and so is only deposited after the other two have entirely come out of solution. Continue driving north to get to stop three, which is by the Stansbury Island Interpretive Trailhead. In the area just north of the trailhead, you'll see that there are several layers of Paleozoic limestones that are tilted, as we see here. Now, going a different way, we have a shoreline from Lake Bonneville that we see highlighted there. We find the same fossils in these limestones that we did in Rock Canyon. And so these should be the same age as the limestones that we saw in Rock Canyon about 300 to 360 million years ago, dating from the Mississippian period. In this picture, we see some Syringopora tablate corals.
And in this picture, we see some horn or rugose corals. In the most fossil rich layer we find here, there are mostly fragments. There are very few whole fossils. This is also a different color than what we see for the limestones just below and above it. This layer is probably deposited in deeper water where corals and other fossils that lived in shallow waters wash down. And this is likely a turbidite deposit, which is a kind of submarine landslide. If we look at a longer section of the exposure, we see that both above and below, there is a darker limestone that does not have very, very many fossils in it. And then we have that lighter band that is very fossil rich, that is mainly just fragments of corals and other fossils from organisms that lived in the shallows that washed down. So that lighter band is our potential turbidite deposit. Again, a submarine landslide. Now looking at the shorelines, we have an example of the Provo shoreline from Lake Bonneville. And uh, remember we have these tilted layers of limestones that are going up the mountain like that. But then we have this horizontal shoreline left from the Provo level of Lake Bonneville there. Now this one does look a little different than what we see for most other places along the Wasatch Front. Instead of forming a notch cut into the hillside, it seems to be built out from the hillside instead. Here is a closer look at that Provo shoreline near the trailhead. Instead of forming a notch, we have a deposit of tufa that has formed and built up the shoreline. Tufa is a chemically precipitated calcite that doesn't have any discernible structure to it. So as opposed to what we see for travertine, which is layered or banded, or the ooids where we have those tiny rounded sand grains. And so the tufas were deposited along the shoreline, mostly on the Provo shoreline. We have some great examples of these on Stansbury Island. Now these tufa shorelines often contain clasts, so gravels and cobbles and even boulders made of Paleozoic limestones and other Paleozoic or Precambrian rocks. Now this demonstrates the principle of inclusions. Remember that the inclusions must be older than what they are included in. Since the Paleozoic limestones form the inclusions, we know that these Paleozoic limestones are older than the shoreline deposit for Lake Bonneville. So Lake Bonneville did not deposit those limestones. It came much, much later. So here we see several of the inclusions inside this Tufa shoreline. Again, the Provo shoreline for Lake Bonneville on Stansbury Island. So again, these limestone inclusions are probably from the Mississippian period, which was between 300 and 360 million years ago. The tufa that is cementing it together was deposited around 14,000 years ago. And so there are hundreds of millions of years difference in age between the two. Remember that the inclusions are always older than what they are included in. And here we have just an obligatory picture of an alluvial fan. You can see how it just kind of fans out from that uh, outwash there. Uh, but in the background, in the background, you can see a shoreline from Lake Bonneville. Again, that's probably that Provo shoreline there. This is the end of the Great Salt Lake and Lake Bonneville virtual field trip. Please be sure to fill out your worksheets and submit those on Canvas to get credit.